Feel that? What's the most important thing in your life? I want you to think about it seriously. What's the most important thing in your life? Jesus, that's a good answer. Thank you. Thank you. They did uh, a survey of so many thousand people in all the capital cities in Australia. And they asked the same question. What's the most important thing in your life? Cars, money, houses, family? Every capital city in Australia. What do you think the answer was? Oh, you're no fun. You all know. The answer was money. Of all the things in the world today, the answer was money. So I ask you again, what's the most important thing in your life? Now I'm not going to talk about things that are too heavy what's happening in the world today. If you want to read what's happening in the world today, read Matthew chapter 24. Because I guess most of you will agree that we are living in the very, very last days of this world. Donald Trump was going to attack Iran. I saw on the TV yesterday morning he rallied the troops and then at the last minute he put it on hold. When I was growing up, if we heard or saw an earthquake once or twice a year, that was amazing. Now we see or hear an earthquake every couple of days in the world. So the world is in a real mess and we at this stage, I believe, have to decide whether we're going to live or die because that's what's going to happen. And I'd like to ask you another question this morning. Is Jesus important in your life? And what is your relationship with Jesus Christ? Don, what is your relationship with Jesus Christ? Neil. Carol. Jane, what is your relationship with Jesus Christ this morning? Because to me, what's happening in the world is quite amazing. And it just tells me that we are very, very close to the end of this world. And to me, that's more important of what is our relationship with Jesus Christ. Because we are deciding between life and death. It's as simple as that. We are deciding between life and death. Bradley and Ben over here, what's your relationship with Jesus Christ? Clark. Paul. David. I want you just to think about it. We read the Bible and say, that's fantastic. We come to church and we say, happy Sabbath, have a nice day. But I would like you to think much, much deeper. Say to yourself, what is my relationship with Jesus Christ? Let's have a prayer before we continue. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the privilege that is ours to be here this morning. We pray and ask, Lord, that you would take away anything that would hinder our fellowship this morning. At the same time, Lord, we ask that you would bless us as we bow before you. We thank you, Lord, for sending the angels to fill the empty seats in our church this morning. And we pray and ask your Holy Spirit will touch each head bowed before you this morning, we ask in your precious name. Amen. Can this come up?
It's a long way away. I'm, unless I come down to the floor. That's a bit too high. See, I'm not as silly as I look. Thank you for that. After many years of unhappiness, Levani, 24 years old, had a little boy, and she remarried this wonderful man. She had everything. And her new husband adored her five-year-old son. Then one day, Levani went to the doctor. She had a bit of a problem. She had to have this small cyst removed. And it turned out, the doctor said, called her back and said, you have advanced cancer. It's not that simple. And when he explained it all to her, she knew what he was talking about because she was a nurse. And she said, but I've got everything. Got a wonderful husband, little boy, a house, got a car each. I got everything. She had radiation treatment for 12 months. And she handled it okay. She got through it okay. And suddenly, one day she was in a room and the, suddenly the whole room lit up. And she felt this warm presence. And she said it was fantastic. She said, in an instant I knew I would be cured. And she went on with the treatment and went on for two years. And when she went back to the doctor for a checkup after two years, the doctors were amazed because there was no sign of any other cancer. Not a sign. No lesions, nothing. And this woman's experience said, she said, perhaps there is a God. Perhaps there is a God. Now, there couldn't be a God when there's what's happening in the world today. And then she looked outside and like me, she saw some little birds. She saw a beautiful garden, beautiful flowers. And do you know, just through that, she found Jesus Christ, how God healed her. And she started praying and her husband started praying. And this woman's experience reflects in the truth these words from the poet Alfred Tennyson where he said, more things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. Do you ever hear anyone that has an answer to prayer? Do you ever hear any stories of people having answers to prayer? Come on. It probably happens to you and me every day. And then a minister, some of these people you've heard of, the minister, Oral Roberts, when he was a, a teenager, he was struck down with TB. And in those days, there was no treatment for TB. And his mother prayed fervently for, for him. And she also urged him to pray for himself. He's a teenager, right? He said, I don't know how to pray. I don't know how to pray. His mother said, you don't have to know how to pray. You just talk to God as if, as if he was in front of you. Just like we're talking now. That's how you pray. Just talk to God. It's a long time ago, but when I was young, 
I was taught the Lord's Prayer as I was growing up. The Lord's Prayer is found in Matthew 6 and verses 9 to 15. And it talks about the common elements of daily living. It's the same thing. How many times do we read the Lord's Prayer or say the Lord's Prayer? We're pretty smart, aren't we? We're pretty smart. We can read it, but it doesn't mean a thing. It doesn't mean a thing. It talks about the elements of daily life, the need for food, the need for forgiveness, received and given, the strength for dealing with temptation. The prayer is brief and to the point. In the original Greek, it is 57 words long. In English, it is 52 words and can be recited in less than 30 seconds. Most of the words in the Lord's Prayer consist of one syllable, which by today's standards means the written form of the prayer is on a second grade reading level. The lesson to learn from this is that we can speak to God in simple, brief sentences. When we pray and we get an answer to our prayer, Do we thank God? Someone said yes. Others said sometimes. And off we go. We're happy again. But it says in 1 Thessalonians in the Bible, chapter 5, be thankful. Whenever you pray, be certain to include a great deal of gratitude and thanksgiving in your prayers. Always be joyful. Never stop praying. Be thankful in all circumstances. I guess when we have a, a major problem, then we thank God more. Is that right? Well, if we have a tiny problem, we just shrug our shoulders and get on with life, forgetting briefly to thank God. What about the Lord's Prayer? Do you know the Lord's Prayer? Don't answer. I'd just like to take a few minutes just to touch on the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven. What amazes me is when we, for each section of the Lord's Prayer, there's another text that builds that up or confirms it. And I remember uh, some years ago, I was a, a literary evangelist for four years, and we went to Warburton in Victoria for a week's uh, get-together. And we were given this, the Lord's Prayer as a project. We had to read the Lord's Prayer that night and study it, and then come back to next morning and discuss it and see what we got out of it. So we started next morning and said, Our Father. It stopped. Our Father. And the minister out the front had a, a whiteboard marker and we filled that whiteboard for half an hour on the words, Our Father. Do you find that believable? That's amazing. Just two words, our Father. Our Father which art in heaven, the cross made this prayer possible. Right? Jesus said, I ascend into my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. As children, did you learn the, put your hand up, did you learn the Lord's Prayer? Yep. It seemed to be, in my day, it seemed to be the thing to do. Parents taught the Lord's Prayer. Hallowed be thy name. And Jesus said, I come in my Father's name. In John chapter 5 and 43, he said, He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. Thy kingdom come. Would you like that to happen? Thy kingdom come. 
And in the Bible, Jesus is revealed as the king. He said, my kingdom is not of this world. Matthew chapter 25 and verse 31 says, When the Son of Man shall come in his, in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. I have a problem and you have a problem too. Did you know that? Because we think about these things on our level, on a human level. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him. Isn't that beautiful? Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 7 it says, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He said, I seek the will of the Father. Give us this day our daily bread. What did Jesus say? In John chapter 6, verse 51, the living bread. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. Forgive us, forgive us our debts. First John says, if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lead us not into temptation. Do you ever get tempted? You walk past the shop and you see a cake shop and you see a cake in the window. Will I go and buy that or will I keep walking? Simple temptation. Do you think Jesus was tempted? It says Jesus was in all points tempted like as we are, yet he was without sin. Then it says, deliver us from evil. And Jesus said, John chapter 12, he said, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Revelation chapter 11 verse 15 it says when the seventh angel sounded there was great voices in heaven saying the kingdom of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever. Amen. In the book of Revelation chapter 3 it says these things saith the Amen the faithful and true witness the beginning of the creation of God. So when we read the Lord's Prayer, just think about it as we read it, what it actually means. And as I was growing up from a, a child right through teenagers, every time I read the story about Jesus, how Jesus suffered and died on the cross for me. I almost cried nearly every time. And I challenge you this morning, as you go home, I'd like you to read John chapter 19. John chapter 19, about Jesus, how he suffered and died on the cross for each one of us. And I challenge you, I would find it very hard to believe that you can read that and not be moved by that. How Jesus died on the cross for each one of us. Another question, how do you pray? How do you pray? Just like the Bible says, I'd like, to do, I'd like to talk to God like I'm talking to you now. Is that right? 
And when I was tiny, I remember someone saying, you can pray anywhere. And I pictured people walking down the street and stopping and dropping on their knees on the footpath and praying. And I thought that was quite funny. But it says we can pray anywhere, just like we're talking now, backwards and forwards. And that's how I talk to God. I talk to God like I'm talking to you now. And I remember when I uh, <clears throat> used to go to that place, you know, that four-letter word? Uh, work, if you don't understand what I'm talking about. Before I retired. And I had half an hour for lunch, and I used to come, I used to work not so far away in uh, disabilities, and I'd drive into town, I had half an hour for lunch. And as I come down Kira Street, I wanted to go to the bank or where up Crown Street, I'd say to God, please, Lord, um, give me a car space. Do you think that's wrong? I don't think so. As I come around the corner, just about every time, there's a car space in front of the bank where I wanted to go. And once I remember coming around the corner up Kira Street and there was no car spaces. And I'm just talking, talking, please Lord, give me a car space. So I went around the block and I said, Lord, this is not happening. It's not good enough. I went around the block and came back and a car pulled out just close to where I wanted to go. Is God good or not? And I've told the story to the children. Once I was going driving home, and uh, I was going down the from Dapdo down that long stretch towards Yalla. And there's a thunderstorm happening around us, and over right across the sky was this beautiful, like a double rainbow. Absolutely beautiful. See, God gave me another. Another joy for the day. And as they're getting closer to home, they reckon if you get to the end of a rainbow, what do you get when you get to the end of a rainbow? A gold? I don't know. Anyway, the rainbow stayed there. And do you know, I will never forget, I drove into the rainbow. And I stopped. And I sat there. I just prayed, thank you, God. Because all ins inside, I, I drove a 14-seater bus, and inside the bus was all lit up with all these colours of the rainbow. I said, thank you, God. I can, I can remember some years ago, Valmo told a story about all her family were trapped inside the house in the Victorian bushfires. And they got inside their soaked clothes, wet clothes, soaked them with water, and they all got in the uh, bathroom. They couldn't get, out, couldn't get away, it was too late. And they, for six hours, they stayed in the bathroom. And they were praying all the time for God to keep them safe. And as they looked out, guess what they saw? Right around the house, was a ring of angels. Right around the house was a ring of angels to keep them safe. Like most parents, our burden as parents is our family. We pray for our family every day, especially when they're not with us. And our family is kind of grown up And I can't help but say, you know, we've got the best, uh, the best grand, grandson in the whole world. We've got the best uh, great-grandson in the whole world. We've got the best great-granddaughter in the whole world. That's good. You're all sitting there. You agree with me. No one's saying that's not right. But they're a burden on our hearts. We pray for them every day. And I guess... I don't guess I know that as parents we do pray. Were you impressed by the uh, children's story this morning? What a great collection of children. Good story too, Steve. 
I don't let you out because you're only you're a big kid anyway. But what a great collection of children we have, and children are important, and we pray for them every day. I can remember one year, our daughter Tracy lives in Tasmania. One year we got a uh, phone call from a partner. Tracy was in a serious condition in Hobart Hospital. And we had to drop, you know, you know what it's like when you're a long way away. And we dropped everything and we flew over there and we walked in and she was all curled up on the bed in a serious condition. We prayed with her. And she came through it okay. And she still says that God performed a miracle on me, Dad and Mum. God performed a miracle on me. And she's doing okay. And she knows what we're doing. She knows what we're doing on Sabbath, what we're doing here today. Friday night comes, she knows what, what we're doing. And a lot of you have met her, and you know what she's like. When I think of our family, I think of that text in the Bible where it says, I will bring your children back from the land of the enemy. I'll bring your children back from the land of the enemy. Now what I'm going to talk about now, I don't want you to think of me. I don't want you to focus on me. I want you to focus on God. Because I suffer from tinnitus. As I'm talking now, the back of my head is buzzing away. Right? It's not about me, it's about God, remember that. And over the years, I've had it for many years, and over the years I've prayed to God, please God, give me a cure. Please God, ease this pain that I'm in. I've had two brain scans, I've had an MRI, I've had two lots of injections in the back of my skull. And the results, nothing. Nothing. Then I prayed to God to help me cope with the pain. Okay, if I'm not going to be cured, help me to cope with the pain. And I asked God, I want this blessing of being able to cope with the pain because I want to be in the new kingdom, don't you? I want to be in the new kingdom. And when I was seven years old, I had a little brother who was five and he died from meningitis. There was no cure in those days, nothing they could do. And I thought, perhaps I'll see James in the new kingdom. And I want to see James in the new kingdom. And there's so many people from our church here that have passed away over the years. I said, I want to see my auntie, Mavis Barton. The old people will remember Sister Barton. I think she was an elder at Coromel Church. I want to see Ron Crofts in the New Kingdom. I want to see Bill Van Fleet, Cor's brother, and his wife, Will Van Fleet. Bill and Elaine Penman. I want to see them in the New Kingdom. Michelle Hill who was a teacher at Coromel School. That was a beautiful when she was laid to rest at Kurumbong Cemetery. All the Cook Islands sat round the graveside and they wouldn't let them fill the grave in. They sat round the graveside and they sang beautifully. And who can not Remember Amy and Stan Musson. I remember Bob Wrench many years ago. Bob used to mow the church lawns. He said, I love mowing the lawns. And I said, you're strange, Bob. No one loves mowing lawns. He said, I love mowing lawns. I said, why? He said, because I can switch off. No telephones, no mobile phones, no computers. I can mow the grass and I can talk to God as I mow. 
The day before Bob passed away, I went in to see him in Wollongong Hospital and he was laying there. I was talking to him. Because Bob told me that he's going to mow the lawns in heaven. His wife came in. She said, do you know Bob's going to mow the lawns in heaven? I said, yeah, he was just telling me about that. And Bob was laying there with his eyes closed. And he said, yes, but I'm going to ask God for a ride on mower. He's got a weird sense of humour like me. And I'll see Bob there in heaven. And Jim Cossa and Louise Cossa. And when I get so bad, the pain gets so bad, I say to God, What's the problem, God? I pay my tithe, I give my offerings. I try to be a good Christian. I want to be in the new kingdom, so what's the problem? Then God, God answered me. Five words. God answered me. By grace are you saved. By grace are you saved. I'd like to share two quotes with you. It says, There is nothing we can do to make God love us more. There is nothing we can do to make God love us less. Isn't that beautiful? There is nothing we can do to make God love us more. There is nothing we can do to make God love us less. A man is born broken. He lives by mending. And the grace of God is the glue. By grace are you saved. I'd like to just share a reading with you about everlasting friendship. Because that's one reason why we are all here today. Because we love each other and we love to be friends with each other. Is that true? In John chapter 15 and verse 15 it said, Now you are my friends, since I have told you everything the Father told me. And this was written by Esperanza Aquino Mapero. She said, Because I am naturally shy, sometimes I do not appear to be friendly. In my heart, though, I long for good friends, because I haven't had many even as a child. My only friends in high school were classmates with whom I worked on activities. In college I had three outstanding friends and we still communicate occasionally. I now have three additional friends whom I met in places I have lived. I also have casual friends with whom I share the same likes and dislikes. Common activities, similar problems and similar backgrounds and philosophies. Friends enjoy togetherness and supportiveness and they understand each other's problems. That, after all, is what friends are for. It is difficult to maintain friendships when we get too busy or move away far apart. So some friends come and go, but others stick like sisters or brothers, or even closer than sisters or brothers. I found a friend, though, who exceeds them all. He finds me when I'm lost, he talks to me without hesitation. He knows where I am and what is on my mind. He assures me when I am in doubt. He responds to my requests according to my needs and what is best for me. I did not recognise his intentions early in life. I never really responded well to his longing to be my friend. I easily lost sight of him yet he never lost sight of me. Even in times of danger and in times when my spirit was the lowest. All I need to do is to call him. I cannot overburden him, I can talk to him 
anytime, anywhere, at no charge. I can even tell him about humorous incidents and he will listen to my sad stories. He lets me express my deepest feelings and heals my hurting self. There is no price he cannot pay, just ask him. I would like to share this friend with you. He has already said that he wants to be your friend. Let him know you would like his friendship. And Jeremiah chapter 31 verse 3 says, O Jesus, you have said, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. Thank you for that everlasting friendship. By grace are you saved. Friends, what is your relationship with Jesus Christ this morning?